What is a sative acontist? Well, in a nutshell, a sative acontist is simply a Roman Catholic who refused to change his religion after Pope Pius XII died in 1958. That's it. Not terribly complicated. Those who publicly adhere to the new religion of the Second Vatican Council are, by definition, not real Catholics, at least not Catholics in the sense in which that term was understood until 1958. And that is the only sense that rightfully belongs to it. Now, an institution that believes, professes, teaches, and disseminates a religion other than Catholicism can be a lot of things, but it cannot be the Catholic Church, which is guaranteed by God to be the ark of salvation that always teaches the true gospel until the end of time, specifically in the Holy See. Yes, it's possible for individual dioceses, individual bishops, to defect, to fall away from the faith, but that is not possible in the Holy See. The Diocese of Rome, the Holy or Apostolic See, is the one diocese which God has promised will never defect, will never fall away from the faith. That is the traditional Catholic teaching. We can find it, for example, in Pope Pius VII's encyclical Diusatis, where he says, quote, Men should realize that all attempts to overthrow the house of God are in vain, for this is the church founded on Peter, rock, not merely in name but in truth. Against this, the gates of hell will not prevail, for it is founded on a rock. There has never been an enemy of the Christian religion who was not simultaneously at wicked war with the See of Peter, since while this sea remained strong, the survival of the Christian religion was assured." Unquote. Also, Pope Leo XIII writes in his apostolic letter Anum Ingressi, quote, "...strong in the divine assistance and of that immortality which have been promised it, it, meaning the Church, makes no terms with error, but remains faithful to the commands which it has received to carry the doctrine of Jesus Christ to the uttermost limits of the world and to the end of time, and to protect it in its inviolable integrity." Unquote. And I'll give you one more, this one from Pope Pius XII. In an allocution of June 2, 1944, he states, Quote, Mother Church, Catholic, Roman, which has remained faithful to the Constitution received from her divine founder, which still stands firm today on the solidity of the rock on which his will erected her, possesses in the primacy of Peter and of his legitimate successors the assurance guaranteed by the divine promises of keeping and transmitting inviolate and in all its integrity through centuries and millennia to the very end of time, the entire sum of truth and grace contained in the redemptive mission of Christ." Unquote. So, the traditional doctrine is pretty clear. And by the way, we've uh, got the links for these quotes in the show notes for this episode, which you can always find at tradcast.org. Just scroll down to Tradcast 29. So anyway, the traditional doctrine is clear. At the same time, it's plain as day that the modernist Vatican has defected, has fallen from the Catholic faith. That's simply beyond reasonable dispute, and I would say even beyond unreasonable dispute. So what do we do with that? Well, the only possible conclusion, that is the only conclusion that does not conflict with Catholic dogma, is that the Holy See has been vacant all this time, and the so-called popes who have occupied the Holy See since basically the death of Pope Pius XII have done so unlawfully and invalidly, meaning they are not true popes but impostors. Now, that may be a shocking conclusion for many, and I know it raises many questions and presents many difficulties, but it's still the only possible conclusion. 
or let me be more specific still, and not everyone will agree with me on this, but I don't consider it completely out of the question that there has been a real pope since Pius XII or even several, but if so, I don't know who that pope or who these popes would be. As far as I can personally tell, there hasn't been a pope since. And no, it's definitely not John the Twenty-Third, Paul the Sixth, John Paul the First, John Paul the Second, Benedict the Sixteenth, or Francis. Now, the people we call the recognize and resist traditionalists or semi-traditionalists are those who insist that all of these supposed popes are valid and legit. It's just that you can't follow them and you can't actually embrace any of their teachings precisely because they're false and dangerous, and even they even constitute a different religion. And then in their argumentation, they try to reconcile that with traditional Catholic teaching and church history, which, of course, always ends in disaster because it's just ludicrous because it essentially reduces the papacy to practical meaninglessness, Right? where each Catholic has to figure out the faith for himself, even determining on his own what sacramental rites are acceptable, what saints are genuine. And then when the Pope says or legislates something the Catholic believes is correct and good, then he assents to that and goes with it, else he simply rejects and ignores it. And that's not following the Pope, that's following yourself. And that's basically how Protestantism works, except the Protestants don't bother with even having such a caricature of the papacy in the first place. The post-Vatican II popes in quotation marks, we like to call them popes, aren't even Catholics. So it's impossible that they should be at any point the true and legitimate heads of the Catholic Church. As Pope Leo XIII said in his encyclical Satis Cognitum, Number 15, quote, it is absurd to imagine that he who is outside the church can command in the church, unquote. Now, interestingly enough, whenever they're not arguing against Sedevacantism, even the recognize and resist traditionalists, at least in an unguarded moment, will admit that these supposed popes are heretics or apostates. It's only when Sedevacanus point out that there are consequences to heresy and apostasy that the Semitrats suddenly remember that you supposedly need a legal declaration by the competent authority before considering anyone a heretic or an apostate. Let me give you a concrete example. On March 27, 2013, the Recognize and Resist flagship publication The Remnant published an article by Robert Sisko entitled Sede of Akantism and the Manifest Heretic. Sisko writes, quote, A pope who merely seems to have lost the faith or who has made statements that are erroneous or even heretical, yet who has not openly left the church or been publicly warned, does not constitute a manifest heretic. And since no such warnings have been given to any of the post-Vatican II popes, either before or after their election, none of them qualify as a manifest heretic. Unquote. Okay, so that's the remnant when arguing against Sedevacantism. You can't say Francis is a heretic because he's not had any canonical warnings. Now, just the other day, on November 19th, 2020, the editor of The Remnant, Michael Matt, sent out a tweet that I happened to see. He's criticizing the fake Catholicism of the former U.S. Vice President Joe Biden. Matt writes, quote, Joe, the Catholic, Biden is an apostate. In other words, he's a product of the modernist hippie revolution in the Catholic Church, unquote. Now, maybe I missed something here, but last time I checked, Joe Biden hadn't openly left the Vatican II Church, nor had he received any canonical warnings from the proper authority. And yet, Michael Matt not only recognizes him to be an apostate, he does not even shy away from publicly saying that he is an apostate. Isn't that interesting? 
See how this works? These people know very well that one can determine that someone is a heretic or an apostate, namely when that is manifest. And then it's clear that one can also say so out loud, of course. Yet there has been no legal declaration to that effect, no warnings, no judgments, no excommunication against Joe Biden, nothing. And yet, Matt calls him an apostate. It's funny how that works. Now, of course, that's by no means the first or the only time that the remnant has labeled people heretics or apostates without them having been declared so, but it is, I think, the most recent example. And by the way, just for the record, that whole premise is wrong. It does not require a legal declaration or a canonical warning to allow others to know that someone is a formal heretic. Although a declaration or a warning may be sufficient to establish pertinacity, they're not necessary. And don't take my word for it. The Moral Theology Manual of Fathers John McHugh and Charles Callum, published in 1958, states, quote, but for formal heresy, it is not required that a person give his assent out of malice, or that he continue in obstinate rejection for a long time, or that he refuse to heed admonitions given him. Pertinacity here means true consent to recognized error, and this can proceed from weakness, for instance from anger or other passion. It can be given in an instant and does not presuppose an admonition disregard it, unquote. So the point is that the sin of heresy, which includes the element of pertinacity, meaning it is not simply a mistake or an inadvertence, but a willful rejection of dogma, that sin can exist apart from a legal declaration or a warning. And if it is public, if it is manifest, then obviously it can be known by other people just like any other public sin. Those are the facts. You know, this whole discussion about whether someone can be a heretic apart from a church judgment reminds me a bit of the abortion debate where the pro-death side will play dumb and argue that the preborn baby isn't a baby or isn't human or we don't know or can't determine that or that it's for the woman to decide, etc. And yet they will only take that position when they're lobbying for or debating abortion. Outside of that debate, in their normal daily lives, they have no problem recognizing the preborn child as a human child. They go to baby showers, they congratulate their friends when they're expecting, they will want to save the preborn baby if the mother gets in an accident, etc. All that assumes, of course, that it is a wanted child, as the sick lingo of our times would have it. Anyway, I just thought this was a, a curious parallel. And no, I am not, of course, suggesting in any way that the recognize and resist traditionalists are pro-abortion or any such nonsense, okay? That should be clear. You wouldn't believe how things get twisted sometimes. I am merely pointing out that in both cases, one side takes a position during an argument that they do not, in fact, follow outside of that debate. All right, let's now move to an excerpt from Tradcast 33, in which the case is made that Sedevacantism is 100% safe and 100% Catholic. This was occasioned by a response to Michael Voris. Would want to chance standing before our blessed Lord, the judge, with that on his soul. Now, of course here, Voris is just begging the question. Obviously, if Bergoglio is not the Pope, then you can't lead anyone out of the Catholic Church by demonstrating that he's not the Pope. In fact, if Bergoglio is not the Pope, then it is a great act of charity to say so. And then Michael Voris is actually the one endangering souls by arguing otherwise and keeping people attached to the apostate from Buenos Aires. It is precisely by pointing out that Francis is a false pope that we help people not to quit Catholicism. Francis is the one literally scandalizing souls left and right precisely because all the evil he does 
is understood to be coming from the Pope. That's what scandalizes people. So making the case that Francis is not the Pope actually helps to undo all the scandal. Ladies and gentlemen, as the apostasy in the Vatican organization progresses, the recognize and resist position, which had been the mainstream traditionalist position for so long, is making less and less sense. Its stubborn defenders are trying at all costs to maintain a position that insists, on the one hand, that Bergoglio is the Pope, and unless you accept that, you're no longer a Catholic. But on the other hand, that you cannot actually adhere to his magisterium without running the grave risk of basically being led to hell. And that's just absurd on its face, because the papacy is not just a label. To say someone is the Pope means he is the one governing the Christian flock and he must be followed because he governs with the authority of Christ. It is Christ himself who guarantees that by following the Pope, we will not be misled. So, reason itself leads to the conclusion that either Francis is the Pope, and then what he teaches is entirely safe for a Catholic to accept, or his teaching is dangerous, infernal garbage, and then he is not, in fact, the Pope. But what you cannot have is the in-between position that he is the Pope, and it's still garbage. As I've said in a prior podcast, you know, you really can't lose being a Sede Vacantis. Because just assume for a minute that Francis were, in fact, the Pope. Well, then what does any of this matter? If Francis is the Pope, then atheists can go to heaven, then Protestant sects are used by the Holy Ghost as means of salvation then human fraternity is the anchor of salvation, and then God wills there to be a diversity of religions. So why not also say to Vacantism? If basically everyone goes to heaven anyway, because being a Christian is only one way of coming to God and not about adhering to a doctrine anyway, if it's all about soup kitchens and caressing the elderly, and if the Jews have their own valid covenant with God, well, then who cares if you go to the Latin Mass and believe in the Old Catechism? If everything Francis teaches is true, then you might as well be a Sede Vacantist because then you won't go to hell for that either. If, on the other hand, Francis is not the Pope, well, then you really want to be a Sede Vacantist. So, really, it's a win-win. What is definitely not possible in all of this is that Francis is the Pope, and you're required to accept him to be saved, but that you must at the same time refuse him submission and flee his teachings, his laws, and his canonizations, likewise as a matter of eternal salvation. Right? That position is completely nuts. In fact, let me go one step further and say something funny but true. Even if Francis is the Pope, he's not the Pope. Ha! What do I mean by that? I mean that if Francis were to meet all the criteria for being a true Pope, and he could still do what he's doing, like, you know, teach heresy in his official magisterium and canonize public sinners as saints and so on, then the Catholic teaching about the papacy would obviously be false. And that would mean that Catholicism is false, which would likewise mean that our Lord did not, in fact, institute the papacy. But if our Lord did not institute the papacy, then there is no such thing as a real pope. Then it's just a human invention. So even then, Francis would not be the pope. But don't worry, our Lord is truly God, and he truly founded the Roman Catholic Church, and he truly instituted the papacy. Jorge Bergoglio just happens not to be a valid holder of that office. Hey, it's a necessary conclusion. And you know what else? It's also a marvelously liberating conclusion. 
to know that that stinking apostate does not, in fact, hold the chair of St. Peter. Don't let Francis play with your soul. Unless you reject his claim to being a valid pope, he will lead you either into the sin of heresy, by making you agree with his manifestly false doctrines, or into the sin of schism, by making you separate from the man you believe to be the Pope. There is only one way out of this dilemma. Recognize that Jorge Mario Bergoglio is a lot of things, but Pope of the Catholic Church isn't one of them.